Come and leave it there. I was down with the no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did for me.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you all the praise. Lord, we thank you for coming and rescuing us. You didn't have to do it, but you did.
it is Sunday morning. It is time for the word of God. I need you to grab your instruments. We're going right into this word. I have a powerful revelation from God this morning. Um, it's going to be a little different than what I normally preach, but it's something God said is, is relevant and like spot on for what's going on right now. Can you grab your Bibles with me? Yep, the praise team was good. We've got everything set up in the anointing for the word. So let's move right now. Second Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. Mm. Verse 1, and it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab, his servants, with all of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. But David tarried at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose off his bed, walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David sent and inquired after the woman and said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her and she came in unto him and he lay with her for she was purified from her uncleanness and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with top child. David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah unto David. We're going to skip down because I'm going to fill you in on this long text as we go through the word this morning. But I need to get to the part of this. So go to, go to the last verse uh, on this text. And that's verse 27. Verse 27 of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But get this. But this thing that David did it displeased the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you this morning. Allow your word to fall fresh on someone. Allow it to lead us and guide us in the direction that your spirit is taking us today, Lord. Calm someone's spirit. Calm their mind. Let them know you're on the job even now. And I thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, take me out of self. Bring me back. Uh, allow you to preach today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to speak from this thought today. Stay off the roof. Stay off the roof. Handle your warfare. It's going to make sense after a while. This morning, I'm going to preach about one of the scariest and saddest stories in Scripture. It is about a man who loved the Lord who the Lord loved, who walked with God, who God seemed to be his heartbeat. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel, he was actually called a man after God's own heart. Now, that's a, that, that's a heavy word to call for a person down here on this side in a sinful body. He's a man after my own heart. Have you ever listened to that? When I was studying this, I said, God, that's a heavy thing to throw on somebody. He was a warrior. He was a poet. He was a great hero and all of these things. And yet, he fell. We're going to look at someone who their actions cursed their whole family. We're going to look at someone who got to the place that they got laxed on their Walk with God, got a sense that they were on autopilot and all of a sudden fell into sin. The reason I said this is one of the scariest and the reason I said this is also one of the saddest is because God placed this in scripture as a warning to us. And it's a warning to us because if God is saying this man is a man after my heart, which I don't think I've reached there, and yet he fell, then the warning is 
It could happen to any one of us. No one has arrived at the place that they got have all of their sins under control and they can stop their sins from controlling their life. All of us are at a place where it is dangerous for us to take any time off from God. And it's important that we continue. I want to show you the tremendous danger in one misplaced lie. One willful disobedience. One sinful act and comment that you can't take back. One moment of weakness where we fell. And it's so devastating, it's hard to recover from our sin. And that is what happened. I, I got an illustration to bring you into present time, and it's almost a hurtful in, in, uh, illustration to me. William H. Cosby Jr., better known as Bill Cosby, we all know him. He can illustrate this fact. He was at one time one of the most prolific well-known, well-respected entertainers in the world. He was a hero to African-Americans because of the fact that his success answered that long-asked cry and question that African-Americans was trying to get everyone else to see. Give us a break and we can be successful. He was the first African-American in a lead role on a television program where he was just a regular person. He wasn't a pimp, you know, he wasn't a janitor, uh, you know, he wasn't a cook. He was actually a hero, a, a spy, a black man playing a regular movie. And then he was a producer, he was an educator. Um, and his, his, his Cosby show broke another racial barrier by showing a middle class African-American family um, that was living a normal life. And they dominated the 8, eight, eight o'clock spot on Thursday nights was dominated by Cosby for the eight years the show was on the air. But then the bottom fell out. Then everything dropped out. And what happened? The Cosby was behind. He was winning in front of the camera, but behind the scenes, he was losing the spiritual battle over his own personal warfare with his sins and his sin nature. That's so important for you to see. He fell. Bill Cosby, people would run around saying, mm, mm, mm. I don't know how this could happen. When I first heard about it, what happened to Bill Cosby? What was he thinking? Oh, man, it was easy for us to put Bill Cosby down. But can I deviate and kind of accentuate something for you to remember? While you're sitting there becoming super holy, let's not forget, before we get too self-righteous, that we all got some sins of our own that we are doing or have done that we don't want on display on social media, and we don't want the world to see what we've done. I mean, it's easy to talk about Bill, but how many will admit that sometimes when I fell from my fallen and depraved nature, and I've done some things, and it wasn't just last year, it wasn't just before I got saved, I've done some things now. The only difference of, I gotta shout right now this morning for all of you, what we should say is thank God, God didn't allow our stuff to be exposed like he did Bill Cosby. Somebody just ought to say, thank God for favor. Somebody just ought to say, Lord, I know I did some things and they're hidden in my heart and I repented. I'm trying to fight for them. But Lord, you kept them quiet. Galatians 6 and 7 said it's going to happen. It said, be not deceived. God is not mine. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. Luke 12 and 3 says this. Whatever you talk about in the darkness is going to be heard in the light. Whatever you speak in the ear in a closet is going to be heard and shouted from the rooftop. That happened to David, a man after God's own heart. All I'm doing is telling you, celebrate this morning. I'm going to go and talk about Bill Cosby a little bit and talk about David. But you need to understand something. If I were to talk about you, all you got is grace mercy and favor over your life and you ought to shout about it. I'm going to get to the bad part, but at least recognize that your God loves you to the point that he covers you and allows you to continue. Go on, Bill Cosby did fall because he didn't handle his personal warfare, but so did David. Hmm. David the conqueror. 
David, this book of 2 Samuel is about David's reign and finally becoming the united king over united Israel. It was written by Samuel the prophet around 930 BC. And what the book tells us is David's reign on the throne. From chapters 1 to 10, David was living the life he was doing what God says. But chapter 11 through 24 was the downfall. And what David did in chapters 11 through 24, starting with chapter 11, affected him for the rest of his life. The bottom dropped out. And there's many of you now, while I'm preaching this, because of this pandemic, you've taken this moment to kind of take a break from God instead of realizing that if I leave off of serving God, some devastating things can happen to me that I may never, ever get back. This text, you know well, but let me give you three points that I'm going to be talking about so you can understand where we are going. Stay off the roof, point number one. Stay with God. Point number two, stay in God's good grace. Point number three, the Bible says it came to pass. It was a time when kings go to war. And it tells us, if I could just relate the story and then come back and bring you the principles, that David stayed home. And when he stayed home, he went to his roof and there he looked and saw the woman bathing and she was beautiful and he couldn't take his eyes off of her. I mean, I don't understand why a man can't take his eyes off a naked woman bathing. Yes, I do. I'm just kidding. But he, took, he didn't take his eyes off of her. And all of a sudden, he found himself lusty. Then he slept with her, giving you the bridge chapter. Because you know, called her husband. When, she, when he found out she was pregnant, David, I'm pregnant. And the next, chapter, next verse says, go get your ride. Understand that. <laughs> it was crazy to me. David, I'm pregnant. What David was saying, he didn't say the Bible time. He was saying, hey, mine, go get your husband. What David was saying is, I'm going to deny this. He had bought into the lie. And all of a sudden, he brought Uriah up. He told Uriah, Goes, how's the war going? You know, how, he brought him up under the pretense of, how's everything going on in the war? Talk to him. Say, oh, now, go down and lie with your wife. But he slept outside on the doorstep with the servants. Then when he found out that he hadn't gone back yet, they came and said, Uriah didn't go sleep with his wife. David said, oh, my God. Called him up and said, why didn't you go? And Uriah said something that is noble, and yet David still allowed himself in his spirit to lead the murder. You know what when Uriah said to him? Uriah said, sir, the ark, the army of, of Israel, uh, Joab, the captain, they're all sleeping in the field. They're all fighting. It wouldn't be right for me to go and eat, drink, and be merry and sleep with my wife. And David still wasn't touched. You know, when you sell out to a sin, sometimes you're in it so deep you don't even know you're sinning. And he found himself saying, oh, I got to do this. Called him back, got him drunk. Then sent him home, but he still would not go sleep with his wife. Here is the deadly thing that he did. He called Joab and said, he sent Joab a letter with Uriah. I'm getting shook here. And the letter said, put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle so he could be killed. You got to be awful low to send a letter to kill a man by the hand of the man you want to kill and sleep with his wife, David was all in. And he found himself waiting on the news that Uriah had been killed. The news came. And then Joab felt bad. He told Joab, Joab, go back. He told the servant, go back and tell Joab, don't worry about this. The sword falls on one just like it does the other. Said, you know, he could have got killed in battle. David then went, waited till the period of mourning was over, got Bathsheba, Married her. But then here's the deadly part, which, which we need to understand. The last verse said, but this thing displeased the Lord. What thing? How did David, this man of God, get to that point? And how are you sitting out there thinking you won't get to that point? Let me share something with you. There is danger when you stay on the roof, when you stay home from fighting, and you go up on the roof, instead of fighting your battles, you stand somewhere on the roof, when it's time for warfare. Let's look at it. The Bible said it came to pass. The year was expired when kings go forth to battle. It was time for battle. What the translation says, it was a season for battle. 
It was a season when kings go to war. You need to understand that in biblical times, wars were not fought during the winter and fall months because of the inclement weather. Rain and coldness made it hard for them to travel and do their military campaigns. So what they did, they fought in the spring. If a war got over, that's why when you read the text, it says a year expired. If a war got over, they wait until the spring and then they go fight more. It was time to go back to war. David's first mistake was not going to warfare when it was time to fight. Seasons. Life is made of seasons. I'm telling everybody that there are seasons of warfare, seasons of good things, seasons of bad days, seasons of plenty, seasons of pressure. All of these seasons we have to live through. The Bible speaks a lot about seasons, but we need to take advantage of each season to remember who we are in the Lord. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. The, the, we, we call him the preacher. He said, there is a time and a season for every purpose under the heaven. A time and a season. I call these life seasons. Many of us sometimes go down because we find ourselves leaving one season and going into a bad season in life. And we forget that life is cyclical and has a lot of seasons. Nobody's going to have a good time all the time. If you're going through a season right now, I mean, there's winter, there's fall, there's summer, there's spring. All of us are going to go through all of those seasons in our life. There's seasons of sickness. There's seasons of happy days. There's seasons of plenty. You just got to remember, here's the catch. If you are a child of God, every season leads you at the end of that season, whether it's winter or summer or fall, it leads you to an abundant life. I know I got a witness because you're sitting out there right now in an abundant position and you've been through some horrible seasons but didn't God bless you because if you're a child of God every season is leading you to better leading you to higher because God promised when he got you out of it you would be better than you were before you went into it so somebody going through a season don't whine don't cry don't sit there and act like you don't understand the same God that got you out before, listen to me, is going to get you out this time. So there's life seasons. So quit looking around. Everybody goes to them. Man up. And then there's seasons of harvest. Galatians 6 and 7 says, when we look at uh, the text in Galatians, it tells us that uh, in, well, no, I better use Genesis. Genesis 8, 22 says that as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. Uh, cold and heat. Night and day, summer and winter. So watch this. He said, God said, I'm going to keep things consistent. Genesis 8, 22, God said there's seed time and harvest. That's important that you understand that season. I call that season of harvest. Many of us are living the harvest of the seeds we planted. You see people running around with joy, making it through tough times, and you wonder how they got through the tough times. It's because when it was time to plant seed in my life, I sowed seeds of good things so I would be ready when the harvest was needed. All I'm saying is I didn't wait till I got sick to say God was a healer. I didn't wait until I got, you know, I lost all my money to realize that he will supply my needs. I did not wait until everything was fine before I said God is a good God. Can I help somebody right now? You ought to be saying God is a good God when you can't see nothing. When you can't see him being good. When you can't see stuff happening, you ought to be speaking that stuff. Because when you say it, God blesses us because we're planting seed and a harvest will come into our life from the seed that we planted. So I'm living. You know what I do? I speak joy so I get a harvest of joy. Some of y'all are so mean and angry and wonder why you get a harvest of nothing. Your harvest is a seed you plant. There's life seeds. There are, there are harvest seasons. And then the Bible tells us not only are these seasons, there is that season of, and this is Galatians, when we need to continue pressing and doing well because we're going to go into a, a due season. Galatians 6 and 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. What do you say, God? We shall reap. This, uh, not I might weep. No, 
God, are you confused, God? I mean, this is a heavy trial. I mean, God said, no, you shall reap if you don't faint. Here's what God is saying. He said in due season, I want to celebrate somebody today to tell you your due season is coming. Hallelujah. You got a season due. Somebody ought to say, I'm due for this. You ought to tell yourself, I'm due for my blessing. I am due for my deliverance. And if you believe God has a season that if I hold on and don't get weary, I will get it. But then there is the final season. First Peter. One, six, and seven, wherein you greatly rejoice, though need be. You are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the glory and honor and praise at the coming of the Lord. Wow, this is the continuous season. I hate to tell you, all the rest of the seasons are dependent upon that season. It's a season where you not only hang in, but you learn to fight through and you learn to have joy and you learn to be patient and you learn to fight and rejoice. And you learn that uh, fighting battles, those words are the words of a good believer. Uh, fighting is not foreign to us. Uh, this is the only season that does not end. This is the season that continues to bless us. What am I talking about? Uh, a friend of mine and I were talking about the trial of George Floyd, and I can't stay here long, but George Floyd and his trial was going through, you know, we, we saw the video. I don't even know why you have to have a trial. Well, I guess I do, but the knee was on the man's neck. He died. I was watching all of the technical language of the experts and what they're the hoops they're jumping through the trial and i was reminded by something from my friend saying wait a minute don't just let this go this is not a slam dunk uh I, the whole world saw it but right now we got to know that we've seen this story before trayvon martin michael brown uh, ahmaud aubrey tamir rice We've seen this story before. Freddie Gray. I, I could keep on going. Sandra Bland. We've seen this story before. We thought that was enough evidence. Nobody got arrested. Here's what I'm getting to. He told me, let's make sure we don't get caught off guard and just be ready to go back and fight. Realize that when the verdict comes out, the verdict might not be what we want. So we got to fight. We got to make sure we don't just fight in you know, tearing up our cities. We got to learn to fight and be ready. Okay, the battle's not over. All I'm telling you is when you go from one victory to the next victory, everything you do in life is going to be about a fight. That was David's first mistake. He stayed home instead of going to war. Second mistake David made was the Bible says he got up out of his bed in the middle of the night and went up to the roof. Now, I read that and I said, what does that mean? Actually, the word is saying, I didn't, I didn't realize, we, you know, when I, when I first read it, I'm thinking David was on the roof. No, it was the middle of the night or late at night. It said evening tide. That meant it was after midnight. And David was laying in his bed sleeping. He woke up and the Hebrew word used there for he took a walk was like he was pacing back and forth on the roof. He was pacing, thinking. So David got up, went up on the roof, and there he saw a woman bathing. She was beautiful, and he lusted after her. Now watch this. David's problem was he went up on the roof, and when you don't fight the battle of holding on and staying in God's will and doing what God said, you now have to fight the battle of an idle mind or the battle of your sin. See, as soon as you walk away from God, your sin nature kicks in and the devil takes advantage of the fact that he knows you're not being obedient anymore. So he gets you with the sin that you have. And we all know the sin that David had, whether you know it, in scripture was David loved women. All through his life, we can look at everything he did. David loved women to the point that he had 19 wives, excuse me, seven wives and 19 children by his concubines and his wives. And those are the only ones that are accounted for in scripture. So David loved women. 
So here's what I think happened. David went up and David was actually creeping. He was laying on his bed. He started thinking about sex. His body got turned on and he went creeping across the room. How do I know that? David's house was higher than the rest of the houses and so he, he in Jerusalem, so he could have a good view of the courtyard. I don't know what he was looking for, but the devil will make sure you find what you're looking for. And there he was. He saw that naked woman and he lusted. And it wasn't the fact that Bathsheba was bathing. Because the text gives us a hint on that. It says that she was clean from her purification. What that means is the law stated that after a woman came off of her time of month, she purified herself. And washing didn't mean she was totally naked. Sometimes they poured water over themselves. I don't know what Bathsheba did. That's not this story. For everyone who want to twist it around to what Bathsheba was doing, no. The fact that David looked and he kept looking. His lust kicked in. David had a lust problem. I said, Pastor, that's kind of hard. Why would you say that? I say that because... Why in the world did he go sleep with a married man's wife when he could have called any one of his concubines or his wife to his bed? It wasn't about the sex. It was about the lust. And it was about him losing the battle with his lust. He did not fight again. Just like Bill Cosby. He didn't fight off. He went up on the roof. He shouldn't have went there. The roof is synonymous with when we get to the point where we think we got it made. I got this. I got my sin. It's like a, a, a cocaine addict going in, into a crack house. It's, it's like an alcoholic who know you just got done drinking. You're going to walk out there with the fellas and watch them drink some cold buds. Come on, man. When you get to the point that you go up on the roof, it's crazy to try to say you can handle something you can't handle. And understand what going up on the roof means. It means when I go up on the roof, I left what God told me to do. And now I got to fight a different battle when I should have been fighting the battle that God gave me. So he went up on the roof and he thought that he lost. Here's the key. If you're going to fight your seasonal warfare... Stay off the roof. Quit. Fight to get off the roof. Don't fool yourself. Don't try to impress nobody else. Fight to stay holy. Fight to stay in God's judgment. Fight to stay in God's will. Stay off the roof. Tell somebody, stay off the roof. Do you know Joseph? We could be saying the same thing about Joseph. After Potiphar's wife, you know the story. Joseph was a nice, strong Hebrew man. Walking around with good integrity, good morals. But Joseph was walking around and Potiphar's wife lusted after him. And the Bible tells us that this last time she put on her best Victoria's Secret negligee, went up to Joseph and said, lie with me. Joseph did not play. Now, most people say Joseph was such a strong man. No, I think Joseph was a smart man. No, Joseph did. He ran. If you want to get the blessing, run. Don't stay there like that. There is no reason for you to stay there and fall when you can get the blessing to go. Which brings me to my coronavirus excuse. There's many of us who are really stunned by this virus. I don't, and it's not a joke. I take it very seriously. We take all the protocols. But there's some of you who have utilized this virus too long. You're not fighting your warfare and you're up on the road. What do I mean? There's some of us, who, and I'm not saying you shouldn't protect yourself. I'm saying you've gotten to the point where you're using the virus to do nothing for God. There's people that stayed home. You don't even call the church and ask, can I do something? I know, I know. Y'all pray for me. You don't even say, well, what, what do we need? No. I'm not, now, if I'm not talking about you, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about people who have gifts and don't realize that you've gotten to the point, just like David, it's time to go to work, but you're staying home and you wonder, oh, I'm not in any danger. It's been a year or so now. Everything else in your life is going on, but you're not serving God at all. Why? Do you know how? What you lose when you can disconnect yourself from God? Ask Jacob. There's no good thing that comes out of taking a break or backing off from God. I don't care virus or no virus. Find out something you can do. There's virtual. There's every something you could do. So here it is. Jacob finally came to his senses. 
in Genesis chapter 32, ground verse 26, God said, let me go. And Jake, Jacob said, wait a minute, I just figured out something. I can't make it without God. I done connived, I done did all my stuff. You know what? He shouted back and God said, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Somebody here ought to tell yourself, I'm, I'm not going to let go of God. I'm not walking away from God. I'm not leaving God. I'm not allowing anything to distract me from God until I get my blessing. Just ask Moses. Joseph walked away with a limp. He, 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 excuse me, Jacob, he figured it out, but he lived the rest of his life. Maybe that's what will happen. You'll just get a limp. I don't have time to preach on that. But then Moses, Moses, the deliverer of Egypt, he brought the people out. He shared, and all of a sudden, God told him to speak to the rock. Moses got angry and said, you know, the Bible says Moses was the meekest man. That's why they tell you don't mess with a quiet person because meekness is really anger under control. But if they lose it, and that's what happened to Moses, he lost it. And Moses found himself striking the rock. And the Bible says, God said, since you did not honor me in front of the people, but God, I was your deliverer. I, 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 you know, I, I spoke to Pharaoh. I, I, I watched the 10 plagues. I've been faithful. He said, you will not go into the promised land. Moses lost his destiny by going up on the roof. And then we have just one more. Or you could lose your life. Judas and Samson, they lost their life. Proverbs 27, 10 says that those who honor God will have a long life, but sin can cut your life short. Check it out. Proverbs 27, 10. Sin can cut your life short. So we found out that he needed to stay off the roof. Secondly, he needed to stay with God. It's right there in the text. And she said, I'm pregnant. Stay with the truth. Stay with the truth. He, he, he. Stay off the roof, but stay with the truth. We found out that the truth will set us free. And a lie will hold us in bondage. Why do people lie? Lies have become so normal, even Christians lie. David, apple of God's eye, just lied over and over again. Lied to your eye. Lied, just lied. And didn't realize in his heart he was leaving God. Watch this. You've heard the story uh, of the preacher who stood up in church and he said, next week in preparation for my sermon, I'm preaching a sermon online. I want all of you to go home and read Matthew chapter 17. Next week when everybody came back, he said, uh, how many of y'all read Matthew chapter 17? Almost every hand in the church went up. He looked at them and said, oh, you just gave me a good start to my message because Matthew only has 16 chapters. Let me prepare now to talk about lying. Or maybe you heard the story of the lion and the gorilla. There was a man looking for a job and he couldn't find one, but he saw an ad for the zoo. He went to the zoo, thought, well, they'll hire me for something. When he got to the Man to be hired, he said, look, our gorilla died a few weeks ago, and we don't have a gorilla. We can't replace one. We got a nice gorilla suit. Will you just be the gorilla? And the man said, it's kind of strange. And he said, hey, the job's a job. So the man got in the gorilla suit and felt kind of awkward at first. But then he got in that cage and started jumping around like a gorilla and got good at it. He became one of the main attractions at the zoo. And all of a sudden, he was swinging one day from vine to vine and swinging all over. And got so crazy, he swung into the next cell where the big African lion was. He felt that African lion's hot breath on his neck. And he sat there and he said, he started screaming, help, help. And all of a sudden, this lion said, shut up, idiot. Both of us are going to lose our job. Everybody's lying. And it may be a little joke, but. Can I tell you, lying is not funny and it separates you from God. The first sin came into the world through a lie. Thou shalt not surely die. If you lie, you actually are a child of Satan. John 8, said you're of your father. Jesus told them who is the father of lies. When you lie, you belong to Satan. And then God commanded us not to lie. Genesis 20, 16, thou shalt not bear false witness. David found himself in trouble because just like us, 
when it's convenient, we lie. But that leads us to our last point. After he sent Uriah back to the front and he got killed and she mourned him, God sent Nathan the prophet. After verse 27, it says, and this thing displeased the Lord. Don't forget that. This thing displeased the Lord. God was displeased. They talking about the preacher. They talking about church. God was displeased. Nathan came and Nathan said, there was a man who had one ewe lamb. Another man had a lot. He took this man's one ewe lamb. Anyway, and David got incensed. David said, who is this man that has all of this and will take something that only one man had? And he looked at him in the best uh, 70s black exploitation flick language he could. He said, you the man. You the man. David, you're the man. It's you. David was crying. He was sinful. But here is the part I'm closing with. The consequences of going up on the roof, staying in David's house to the rest of his life. It's sad because his whole family was cursed through this man who really loved God but had that one moment of indiscretion. Had that one time when he should have went to war, he stayed home. Had that one time when he disobeyed God. Just once. And never recovered. Here's what he said. God said because, and, and I'm, I want to read this to you because this is what it says in chapter 12. God said because, verse 10 to 13, because of what you did, the sword will never leave your house. Ammon, Absalom killed each other. Ammon raped Tamar. The sword, the killing, never left his, left his house. Three of his sons died violently, a consequence of David going up on the roof. He said, because of that, your wives shall be embarrassed in front of the whole country. Everybody's going to see it. When David was older, Absalom actually slept with his father's concubine, which was like a wife, in the midst of all the people. The whole city saw it. The last curse was, and the child that Bathsheba is carrying is going to die. And the son died. David said, I got a good note. David said, Nathan, I've sinned before God. Look at God even at the end. God said to him, yes, David, you have sinned. Here are the curses God's going to do. But before he pronounced the curse, he said to David, but God said, he saved you. You're not going to die. See, he should have gotten Mur killed because of the murder he committed. He should have died. His penalty should have been death. But God said, I'm going to hold back my grace. And from that point on, David learned from Psalms 51. You've read it. His heart repented. His soul repented. His mind repented. But David learned how much it costs. That one thought, ah, you know, stay away from God for a little while. Just going to go up on this roof. Stay off the roof. Fight your warfare. Handle your battles. Because when we please God, that's what David learned. The blessings come. The blessing is in pleasing our Lord. It's pleasing God. I'm closing now. So let's recap. So he... Went up on the roof. Didn't stay with the truth. Didn't please God. But when a man pleases God, he gets blessed. Psalm 37 and 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his word doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Just as all of those, all of us who have received favor, when you please God, can I close this message with telling you, try your best to stay off of that roof. Follow God. Don't depart from God. 
Fight your warfare. Stay off the roof. Please God. And watch the blood. You can turn around anything in your life right now. If you continue to walk a walk that pleases the Lord. God bless you. Hope this word has blessed somebody. Go, go to our chat. Read it again. Uh, watch it again. Tell somebody, come, you know, go to our Facebook, our YouTube, our Instagram. I just need you to know that the saddest thing in the world is David never, ever, ever recovered everything for that one, one mistake, that one dreadful act of disobedience. God bless you. See you next time. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down. But with the no way up and I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living just existing Well and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free